I have found out beat news in depth for you. Good evening and welcome to Outbeat News in Depth. I'm Greg Moralia. Well, this month we're celebrating Valentine's Day by giving you an in-depth look at your kinky side. We have two guests tonight who will offer some suggestions and an app for you and your partner to use to explore what has long been part of the greater leather community. Mr. Ramrod 2015, Darren Mazaika is back to share his experience in the leather community and to tell us about his current run for Mr. Leather International. And in the second half of our hour, we'll have the creator of the new Kinky app, that's K-N-K-I, Carl Sandler, who will share his ideas about how you can use technology to discover kinks and fetishes that perhaps you've only thought about. It's going to be a kinky Valentine's Day here on Outbeat Radio, and it's all coming up next, right after your Outbeat Radio news for this Sunday, February 28th, 2016. I have found Outbeat Radio news. Your source for LGBT news from the North Bay and beyond. Out Apple CEO Tim Cook is winning kudos from corporate leaders, Apple devotees, and private rights activists for his defiance of a court order to unlock one iPhone. But it's not just any iPhone. It belonged to one of the terrorists who killed 14 people in San Bernardino last year. Earlier this month, a federal judge ordered Apple to provide the FBI with access to information on that iPhone, which, like all iPhones, is encrypted. The FBI contends the data could help investigators, but in a message to Apple customers, Cook wrote that if his company were to cooperate with the order, which is to create new software to hack the device, quote, building a version of iOS that bypasses security in this way would undeniably create a backdoor. And while the government may argue that its use would be limited to this case, there is no way to guarantee such control, end quote. The Los Angeles Times reports Cook's refusal may well define his legacy even more than the work he's done since succeeding Apple co-founder Steve Jobs. And some observers believe the fight could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And last week on Outbeat News, we reported on the new policy adopted by Adidas that guarantees any sports athlete who comes out as LGBT that they will not lose a contract with Adidas. That same week, Nike officially ended its working relationship with boxing champ Manny Pacino, reacting to negative comments he made about gay relationships. Though the boxing star and Philippine Senate candidate apologized for denouncing people in gay relationships as, quote, worse than animals, end quote, he stood by his opposition to same-sex marriage. This wasn't nearly enough to win favor back with Nike. Bacchino said in remarks posted online by TV5 Network, quote, it's just common sense. Have you seen any animal having male-to-male or female-to-female relations? If you have a male-to-male or female-to-female relationship, then people are worse than animals. Nike's official statement read, We find Manny Bacchino's comments abhorrent. Nike strongly opposes discrimination of any kind and has a long history of supporting and standing up for rights in the LGBT community. And in response to new polling, the Human Rights Campaign announced last week that a majority of Americans support a bill like the Bipartisan Equality Act, which would extend existing LGBT civil rights protections to LGBT people. The polling was released by the nonpartisan Public Region Research Institute and involved more than 42,000 interviews in all 50 states. 70% of those surveyed by the Institute indicated that they would support a bill like the Equality Act. David Stacey, HRC's Government Affairs Director, said, It's long past time for Congress to end the status quo where LGBT people remain at risk in a majority of states of being denied services or fired because of who they are or who they love. A majority of Americans agree whether they are living in a red or blue state. Americans across the country get it and understand that everyone should be able to live free from fear of discrimination and have a fair chance to earn a living and provide for their families. Now here's your calendar events for the coming week. On Monday, February 29th at 2 p.m., the Sonoma General LGBT Support Group will gather at the Sonoma Community Center, 276 East Street in Sonoma. And on Tuesday, March 2nd at 10 a.m., the Napa Valley Older Adults Discussion Group will gather at the Queen of the Valley Community Outreach Center, 3448 Bill Lane in Napa. And also on Tuesday at 6 p.m., the Transgender North Bay Male to Female Group will meet at the Positive Images Center, 312 Chin Street in Santa Rosa. And on Wednesday, March 4th at 5 p.m., Spectrum's Youth Support Group will gather at the Spectrum LGBT Center, 910 Irwin Street in San Rafael. 
And on Thursday, March 5th at 12 noon, the men's brown bag lunch discussion will happen at the Spectrum Center in San Rafael. For more information about LGBT events happening here in the North Bay, go to GaySonoma.com. And for all the latest LGBT news headlines, go to our website at OutBeatNews.com. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for updates from OutBeat Radio News all week long. For Gary Carnavelli, I'm Greg Moralia. OutBeat Radio News, your source for LGBT news from the North Bay and beyond. Leather has a long history in the gay community and includes everything from fashion to a wide range of sexual fetishes and kinks. After coming out as a gay man, Darren Mazaika found his place within the leather community and this year is competing for the title of Mr. Leather International. Darren, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me back. So you're back this month to talk about a recent award that you got uh, for your work in the leather community and really to educate us about the broader issues in the leather community. So let's start out by having you tell us a little bit about what attracted you uh, to get involved with leather. Well, I think it started when I first came out uh, as gay in 2010. Um, And my first experience to Castro, I really didn't feel, felt like I fit into the typical uh, gay scene. Um, Coming from a career in law enforcement and a very masculine atmosphere, career. Um, for me personally, I just didn't feel like I fit into the typical bars in Castro. Uh, and then when two of my friends took me to the leather bar in San Francisco called Powerhouse, the moment I walked in, I just felt a sense of belonging, that mm-hmm. here is a group of men and also women who were comfortable with themselves to wear leather and to be masculine and that they didn't care what other people in the gay community thought of them. They could just be themselves. And that I got a immediate sense of belonging when I had my first experience at powerhouse. That's interesting because I think a lot of folks would be very intimidated by that first time experience walking in the door to a leather bar because it is a very different atmosphere than the sort of typical straight bar that you'd go to or sort of the generic mixed gay bar. Uh, you know, what do you think helped you feel so comfortable immediately as opposed to walking into a more traditional bar? It can be intimidating and people tell me it is intimidating to go into a leather bar. But for me, it just felt like a safe place for who I am because there's such a big spectrum within the leather community uh, that it includes everyone. Uh, It doesn't matter how kinky or how not kinky you are. It just is a place that you can be yourself and express yourself in ways that may not be accepted in straight bars or other generic gay bars, as you said. Um, and it's a way to also show who you are as a LGBT person, um, what you're into or what you are interested in as a person um, or as a fetish as well. And it's a welcoming place. And, but it can be intimidating that first time. But for me, I guess growing up uh, – with a father as a firefighter and then myself being a police officer, I always had that uniform, macho atmosphere around me. And I, that's who I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just, the light bulb went off when I walked into Powerhouse and it was who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. And I just felt a sense of freedom when I walked in there. Yeah, yeah, I get that. So, Tell us more about the leather community as a whole. Explain it a little bit. And what all does it include? Well, the leather community is a subculture within the LGBT community. Um, It can be dated back, or you could say uh, since the late 1940s. Um, It kind of grew out of the post-World War II biker culture. 
you had these men being discharged from the military for being gay. They didn't feel like they fit into the stereotypical gay community. Uh, so they created their own little subculture um, by belonging to motorcycle clubs uh, and creating a, a safe place for them after being discharged from the military. And it was um, really established in the big ports with, uh, throughout the country. San Francisco was a huge port. Um, so it kind of grew out of the biker post-World War II era of how it started. It not only includes gay men, but there is lesbians, there's transgender, there's also heterosexuals within the leather subculture, because uh, it's a place where people can just be themselves and express themselves who they are because of their interest either in uh, BDSM um, or leather. So BDSM, just for our listeners to make sure we understand what that is, that's bondage and... So BDSM, so the B stands for bondage, the D is discipline, the D can also be dominance, and the S is submissive, and then sadomasochism. Sweet pain, as it's often referred to. Yes. So there's a kinky side to the leather community. It's not just about a costume or an attire or a style of dress, right? There is a sexuality or an aspect of sexuality associated with it. So for the leather community, it is a way to express their erotic fashion when it comes to leather. Uh, but there also is the side of the sexual kink and fetishes within the community. And that's where you see the leather colors. So each color represents a different fetish. Um, and depending on what side you wear, either a hanky or an accessory of a color, it signifies to a person if you are a top, a bottom, versatile, if you give or receive a particular fetish. So the colors are a way to say what fetishes you're into without having to verbally say it, which dates back to the time where it was illegal to be gay and you couldn't talk about it. So it was a, a way for the gay men to express their sexuality through colors. Right, and that's how men would find themselves. I mean, it dates way back, as you mentioned, to the theater district in New York, where men would wear matching scarves and ties with their suits. Not leather suits at the time, uh, but that was the symbol. And so that's really, really interesting. And I would imagine that there is much less judgment around... Uh, the display of your fetishes, if you will, in the community, as opposed to maybe where people might feel more intimidated in a quote-unquote mainstream environment, right? Exactly, because everyone that wears a color is representing who they are as a person and expressing themselves. So if you're at a leather bar or at a leather event, you're showing who you are, but it's also a way to try to find someone who has the same interests and fetishes as you. Uh, but at the same time, if I was to wear my colored leather out to a generic gay bar, a lot of people may not know what the colors represent, and they can see it as just a fashion accessory. And that can be good if people are, don't know and, and they just think it's an accessory, or I can also educate people about what it is in the history of the leather uh, and what the colors represent. And that's what... I'm trying to do as the current Mr. Ramrod um, is to try to build a bridge between the leather community and the non-leather community and bring it together so there's not this divide within the, within the two subcultures in the gay community. So let's talk about Mr. Ramrod. Uh, you were selected as Mr. Ramrod 2015. Tell us about that competition and what that all entailed and, and what it means. Well, uh, the competition was in October of 2015. Each year, the bar in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Ramrod, has a competition for their title. Uh, and it consisted of interviews by a panel of judges. Then I had to 
go on stage in front of the bar and get a random question asked to me. Then I had to create a three minute fantasy story. Uh, any type of fantasy story uh, for the audience. And then the last was the physique and also my formal wear uh, in leather gear. And so who votes? Uh, the panel of judges. So the panel of judges uh, for me were all previous Mr. Ramrod winners. And this isn't a unique type of a competition, right? This is pretty standard throughout the world in the leather community, isn't it? Correct. Um, so it may have this year I'll be competing as Mr. Ramrod at International Mr. Leather, uh, where people from all over the country and the world who have won either bar titles or state titles will be competing for the International Mr. Leather uh, title. Uh, so it has become this huge international competition right. for the leather community. There's a lot more to this than just a fashion display. You're expected to do some or provide some leadership in the community. So talk about, as Mr. Ramrod, what are some of your goals and some of the messaging that you hope to communicate uh, in the coming year? You talked a little bit about educating people and what the leather community is, but you've got some other ideas about what you want to take on, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, basically, if you could think about it as a platform, and my platform, I want to have an inclusive environment, especially for people who are curious about the leather scene, um, but maybe intimidated. I want to be that helping hand to get them just interested or show them what the leather community is about, not to be alone when they want to ex just experience or experiment or just see what it's about, um, if they have any interest in it. But I also want to have causes that I want to get promoted out there into the community, especially where I live in Wilton Manors. People don't talk about, and it's a big issue, is domestic violence. And domestic violence is a huge issue for me, especially being a former police officer, that it's not talked about in the gay community. And there's not a lot of resources for gay men who are victims of domestic violence. Because when you think about domestic violence, there's a ton of resources for women who are victims by their husbands. But if you think about it, where can a gay man go if he is a victim of domestic violence? I want to make sure that the resources that are available are made aware to the community, not only in South Florida, but I want to make sure that it gets recognized on a national level level or international level, which is what I'm looking forward to at International Mr. Leather. And I think that's pretty interesting, particularly in this venue within the leather community, because I don't think domestic violence in the gay community is well understood by law enforcement, period. Maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not given the same recognition as an issue by the greater society, but within the leather community and within the sexual fetish community that involves bondage and sweet pain, as we talked about it earlier, law enforcement may not have an understanding about that at all. So I would imagine it would be very difficult for a couple that maybe is involved in those kinks or those fetishes. It would be even more challenging for them to reach out. Correct. And the thing about BDSM is that it is a adult contract between two individuals who are making a decision together to enter into a BDSM relationship in play. Think of it as safe, sane, and consensual. As long as what you're doing is safe, both of you are sane, and both of you are giving consent, then that's what BDSM truly is. Without that, then it becomes and crosses the line into domestic violence. Someone should never be forced to do something against their will. I if it's consensual, then, then it's BDSM. I really like that. Safe, sane, and consensual. That could be a great tagline uh, for your campaign. So talk about your preparation for Mr. Leather International. This is a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, What are the expectations of you, and, and how are you preparing for it? So International Mr. Leather is... 
a big deal within the leather community. There's probably going to be between 50 to 60 individuals competing for the title from around the world. Um, we have new countries being represented this year that we're excited about. I believe Israel's being represented for the first time. Ireland, we have a Mr. Leather France. So it, it's this huge competition and the preparation is pretty intense as I found out. There is mock panel being done to help me prepare. I'm getting help having more stage presence, being able to communicate via a microphone in front of 15,000 people looking at me on the stage and just being comfortable with myself and who I am as a person. Um, but the biggest thing that I've been told is just to have fun and not take it so serious. Because if you're not your true self, the judges are going to pick up on that and realize that you're not being who you truly are. And that's my motto is I'm just going to have fun, but at the same time, I'm going to compete for the title of International Mr. Leather. And I'm going to go and promote my causes and make awareness to things that need to be dealt with it within the gay community, but also in society in general. Mm -hmm. and, and I think most people know that there's a Mr. Leather, but there's also a Miss Ms. Leather competition, right? Yes, there is. There is. It's IMSL. It's International Miss Leather. She is the same level, just uh, the female version of International Mr. Leather. So what kind of backing are you getting? I mean, obviously, there's money involved, there's costs involved in competing, uh, and community support. Talk about the support that you're hoping to get and how you're doing it. Uh, the community has actually been very supportive of me. Uh, they are throwing fundraisers. They're buying raffle tickets because uh, I'm auctioning off a pair of boots to help with my IML travel fund. And the leather scene in South Florida is probably one of the biggest in the country. And the last time a Mr. Ramrod won International Mr. Leather was 11 years ago. And so the community, I have this sense that they want to see the title come back to South Florida um, and want me to represent not only the country, but internationally as well. And they have gotten behind me. They are supporting me in more ways than I thought. And it's unbelievable just the outpouring of community support that I have received since winning Mr. Ramron. That's really cool. So I'm sure you've thought about winning. So you're going to have this international platform, and you mentioned that you have several causes. We've talked about domestic violence. What other interests, what other messages do you hope to, to share on this platform? So if I was to win International Mr. Leather, I want to strive to protect what the leather community is, what it was in the past years, and what it will be. Because the leather community has become a safe place for people to express themselves either sexually or not sexually. And it's just a place where people who may not feel like they fit into the generic gay bar can go and just be themselves. And that's what I want to do. And I want to make sure that people who are coming into the leather community have a safe place to go and feel welcomed. Sounds like a great aspiration. Um, so let's move to that. This month we're talking about what leather is and the greater BDSM community. For that listener out there who's been curious or maybe has been inspired to be curious by listening to you, how does someone begin? Where do they go to explore? How do you get started? There there's so many resources online if you have any interests or questions about what the leather subculture is. So definitely you can go online um, or find out if your community has a leather bar or has a leather store, a place that sells leather gear, fetish toys, because they're going to be the people that will be able to tell you what's going on in the community and where you can go for either meetings or bar events. And don't be afraid to ask questions or even ask for help of, hey, I'm curious about a harness or I'm curious about 
the different colors or the hankies? What do they mean? And people are more than happy to educate others about the leather community. So you could actually go to one of these stores and perhaps see that there are classes or demonstrations available so that you can explore and see if a particular fetish or interest is appealing to you. Absolutely. And they will have, they will have classes. They will give you links or websites. And they even give you a list of events around the country for different types of fetishes or kinks. Uh, in April, I will be attending CLAW, which stands for Cleveland Leather Awareness Weekend. And it is a weekend of educational classes. Um, I have been asked to host one of the parties there, but it is a, a weekend for people that are within the leather community or into kinks and fetishes that can take classes and be educated about whatever the fetish they're into. Sounds a lot more interesting than a history class, huh? Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, and we're fortunate here in the Bay Area, too. I mean, we have several events that happen every year. They've been, they've been going on for decades, the Folsom Street Fair and Dor- Dory Alley. I think what's interesting about Folsom Street is that it is not exclusively a gay event at all. In fact, it's, there are more straight couples there now today uh, than gay couples. So this is not something that is unique just to the gay community. This is uh, a fetish or a collection of fetishes and interests that really spans the entire sexuality spectrum. Absolutely. Fol- um, Folsom Street Fair has definitely become, I'd say, more straight-oriented than, than gay-oriented. And this past weekend, I went to Mid-Atlantic Leather um, in D.C., and there were straight people at that event as well. And just because... They're heterosexual. They also are into uh, dominance and submissive roles. They're into kinks and fetishes. And we welcome that as a leather community because it's not just a gay, a lesbian, transgender, but it's an all-inclusive community. And that's what it was formed on. Fantastic. Well, Darren, thanks for shedding some light on what's been largely a, a fairly hidden part of the community. Um, and educating us tonight. We've been talking with Darren Mazaika, Mr. Ramrod 2015, and a competitor in the upcoming Mr. Leather International. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, and thanks again for having me. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Outbeat News in Depth on KRCB Radio 91. I'm Greg Moralia. Well, Fifty Shades of Grey was a book and a film that exposed the largely hidden and invisible world of sexual fetish and kink. Carl Sandler created the Kinky app, that's K-N-K-I, that allows gay and straight people alike to venture out and explore the world of kink. Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic to talk to you all the way from Australia. Uh, Yes, it's uh, very different than the New York winters. I bet it is. Uh, So before we get to talking about this app, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into designing this particular dating app. Well, my background is actually in mobile web development, um, e-commerce, um, and I before developing the Kinky app, uh, I we also started DaddyHunt.com, and we have the Daddy Hunt app and Mr. X app. So we have many years of experience building and nurturing uh, an online community, whether that be on mobile or on web. And so, you know, we had the technical expertise and the understanding of how to work within both Apple restrictions and Google Play restrictions to be able to start looking at other opportunities where we could basically leverage leverage those talents that we have and look, you know, and say where else is there a need that 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 hasn't been met. Mm-hmm. So before we get talking about Kinky, which is the the newer of the apps, right? Yep. Tell us about some of the other ones that you mentioned and how they're different from, let's say, the grinder and scruff apps that we might know. Sure. Well, daddyhunt.com is the, the easier one to explain. I mean, daddyhunt.com started back in 2006, and it was really uh, one of the first websites that really targeted gay men over the age of 40 and people who were their admirers. And what we learned very quickly was that People who were older needed a different kind of engagement. I mean, of course, yes, they wanted to hook up in the same way, but they were actually looking for more validation and acceptance. And in fact, the, there are a lot of people that are into older guys, but it's kind of hard sometimes to get that message on a more generic 
a website or app like Grinder or Manhunt even back in the day. So we found immediately daddyhunt.com had taken off because it really resonated with people who really wanted to find someone younger, older, or even older, older, and in a way that was uh, just not the same kind of pressure and, you know, sometimes rejection and, and, you know, bad behavior that happens on some of the other apps. And so we really were able to foster a sense of real community within the daddy hunt world. Um, you know, we have a, also a set, just as we do on Kinky app, we have a set of uh, a daddy hunt code, which talks, it's almost like a code of online behavior and ethics that we ask people to sign into. Basically, we, we, we take a big effort to try to make a, a very supportive and welcoming community for daddies and daddy lovers. And that community has grown over the years. And recently, maybe about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we launched a dedicated app for daddy hunt as well um, that innate, basically brought the same community, but to the, the mobile app world. And uh, Mr. X you know, started out as kind of a little bit of a similar, a similar thing to Daddy Hunt in that it was providing a, a safer space, a space where you could date, a space where you could meet people for people of all ages, not just older, younger, or just daddies. Uh, and Mr. X were actually moving it even more into a social uh, networking space in the coming year. Um, you know, both apps provide not just the dating features that you would find on, say, a Grinder, uh, but also provide the ability to like and comment on photo- photos, get followers, follow people. It's its really designed to really nurture a sense of community and belonging and bring the social sharing tools that people like so much on Facebook and Instagram into, into basically a private community. Mm-hmm. And this is international, right? You've got people from all over the world. We do have people from all over the world, although you know our largest demo is in the U.S., uh, maybe the U.K., Australia. Uh, so we haven't, we haven't made quite as many inroads in some of the other far flung regions of the world, but mm-hmm. we're, we're working on it. Interesting. So the, those two sides have been primarily, well, exclusively for gay men, right? That, yeah, that's right. right. Only for, for men looking for men. But kinky, you've broadened out a little bit. Uh, I went on the website and took a look at it and at least on its surface, it looks like it is very much open to men and women of all sexual orientations. It is, and we we did that deliberately. So with Kinky, uh, you know, we started really thinking about Kinky because people, we heard in the community, we spoke to, we have a good relationship with kink.com, we spoke with other folks in the space who really told us that there was no social network, no dominant social network that was mobile for the kink community, someplace where they felt they could go to date and they could also social network, but also brought them all the geolocation-based features that they've come to expect. And the more we we spoke to people, the more we were told, yes, we were looking for a place. And you know, one of the things that I've learned in general is that if you can meet a need that's not being met, you know, your <laughs> life is very easy because in these in, in a dating environment or in a social networking site, critical mass is key. You have to be able to keep people in there. So if you have something that people genuinely want to use, and if you allow them to play a role in forming the community, then you can build momentum. And what we've seen with Kinky is that. We are getting a lot of uh, people who are very interested in becoming part of the community and in building it from the ground up. They want something, they need something, and they want it to have all the full-fledged features of, of other mobile apps. It's interesting because I think the Fifty Shades of Grey movie uh, sort of exposed the idea that there are straight folks who enjoy kink. Um, I think the gay community, that's probably always been there. At least that's my knowledge. That's my experience uh, with it. But with use of a, an app like, let's say, a traditional app like Grinder or, or, or Scruff, a traditional dating app like Grinder or Scruff, you know, it it takes a little bit more work to find someone who's into kink as opposed to going right to an app that's specifically providing access to folks within those distant different sub communities, right? That's the case. But I think more importantly, there's just so much judgment even in the gay community. I see all the time people people who have kinks a lot of time I mean in my mind people who are able to explore and push themselves sexually and are aware of their sexual issues can be very highly evolved and enlightened people you know I believe that in America in general you know we're brought up with so much shame around sex and so much fear around sex that some of our deepest darkest fantasies are things that we aren't even comfortable sharing with our, our primary partners if we have one. So I think that when people have a, 
some kink, whatever that may be, a lot, they risk being misunderstood. They risk, you know, even on a, an app that's a gay app that you would think would have a lot of tolerance, um, like one of the major apps. So I think that there is an, you know, people want to feel safe putting out there what it is that they want to explore and not being judged. And that's really what Kinky provides. It provides an area where you can basically say, explore whatever it is. If you want to wear, you know, dog masks, if you want to wear, you know, if you're into spanking, you know, you're not going to get the kind of judgment and shade that you would get on in other places. Right. Well, and I agree with you. I think that there is so much more to an individual's sexuality and their interests um, that they don't put that right out there because, uh, like you say, they fear being rejected. They fear being unappealing, at least on the surface. I get the sense that pe- there, there are a lot more people out there that have multiple sides to their sexuality than just what they present. Well, absolutely. Right? Because you, people are being very strategic on what they present too, right? It's a little bit like fishing. You, know, you, you want to get the largest net and then whittle it down once you feel comfortable. But I see it all the time. I mean, even on Daddy Hunt, there are many, many younger guys who are into daddies and they'll say things like, oh, my friends make so much fun of me, right? So they're into daddy and they're like, why? You're so hot. Why are you into daddies? You know, there's – in the gay community, in the straight community, I think that there is just – people project their own insecurity and their own judgment onto others. And when you're basically putting out onto a website or an app what your deepest, darkest you know, fantasies might be, you know, you are really making yourself vulnerable, and you're, you're vulnerable to 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 judgment, and that's why kinky is success is 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 successful. That's why people are it's resonating with people is because they want to be in a place where they feel like they can talk about whatever they want to talk about and find people who share that interest without that fear of judgment or fear of being you know discovered. Right, right. So before we get into some of the specific communities that folks can identify with or connect with on Kinky. Did you see any change or any any growing interest from the time period following Fifty Shades of Grey? Did you see any shift either from the straight community or gay community where people were maybe more willing or more interested in exploring that side of themselves? Well, I, I don't know because we only just launched in the you know since in the post Fifty Shades of Grey world. I know that many lifestylers, many people within the the, the kink community, you know, didn't like the depiction in Fifty Shades of Grey of the relationship and some of the issues. You know, I personally I didn't read the book, but I saw the movie, and I personally found it very challenging from the point of view of, of someone who you know, uh, someone who appreciates the kink world that, you know, the main character would willingly, you know, submit and enter into this relationship and then have so much feel like she had to escape it. It, it was, it didn't really reflect anything that I've seen in the kink world. Um, I, however, that being said, you know, the, the, the book and the movie were huge successes, which shows that there is a tremendous interest and appetite in kink, even if people are afraid to pursue it. And what we hope with kinky is that, that people who are most in the lifestyle, people who are who understand, you know, how to create boundaries, who understand, you know, how to operate in a healthy, consensual, uh, aware way within the kink community, can really become part of it, and then create a welcoming space for people who are just exploring, so that they can feel safe as well, and that they don't also feel judgment because they're new and they don't understand, but they're 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 willing to dip their toe in the water, so to speak. So, you know, we're really building this as a way for. You know the kink people in the kink community to come in and make it into their and make it into their own, and that's the tools. And it's not just for dating. You can come there and you know you can just be you know you can just be some more of a voyeur. You can chat, um, and you can decide you know what to share and when. So let's talk about what exactly kink includes. I have my own idea about what that includes, but within the app and what the the broader community that you're trying to attract. Talk about some of the subgroups or sub interests that are within the broader category of kink. Well, I mean, there's, 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 frankly, there's everything. I mean, we we're basically designed the site with, uh, with to have hashtags, so that people can basically put in whatever their interest, their 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 interest may, whether it's paddles, whether it's bondage, whether it's spanking, whether it's you know role play. There's whether it's leather. You know, there's so many different things. There's so many different kinks. I mean, I couldn't even begin to name them all. And whatever that person's proclivity is they can basically tag themselves and 
other people can find them through the through hashtags. And that's our way of basically saying, you know what, go free and create the community that you want. Whatever your whatever your the thing is that you're interested in, you can you can basically own it and be here and find other people who share that. I like so, that because the the terminology around sexual orientation is changing so quickly that it's hard to keep up with what every word means and there certainly aren't enough words out there to you know very accurately describe every point in that spectrum. So it's flexible enough then for a person to to go on and really identify in whatever variety of interests they might have, right? Exactly. And it's amazing to me, especially the younger generation, how free they are a lot of times in being able to own their kinks. Like I see a, I see a change happening and I don't know if it's because of the internet or I don't know if it's because we just, our society is evolving, but I see a lot of young people, you know, within Kinky App, I just saw a straight guy. He loves female domination. You know, I don't know where he would be comfortable, you know, saying that within uh, the context of an app, right? There's, there's just so much there's, there's so much judgment that can come there. And so Kinky really is creating a safe space for him. And we also want it to be a place that's, that's cool. We want to make Kinky a place where people can talk about sex and sexuality in an open way that is validating, encouraging, and really says, you know what? It's, a, it's cool to actually be someone enlightened enough to be, if not aware of, of what turns you on sexually, but willing to actually explore and push your boundaries to see, to, to discover what that is. Because I think so many people have so much fear around their bodies. They have so much fear around sex that it inhibits them from really actually letting go and being able to explore what it is that turns them on. And that's fundamentally what we're talking about here. It's what it, what does turn you on? Sometimes what turns people on what turns one person on may be scary to someone else. And that's why we label it and think of it as being something far away. But in, in a lot of ways, we, 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 all have, we all have sexual feelings. We all have, have things that get us excited. We may not have identified and realized that that's our thing, but I'm sure that most you know, healthy sexual people have those things. Right. Are you seeing couples together uh, going on the site? You know what? I have not seen that many couples. We someone recently asked about us uh, creating a setting. You know, we're, we're listening very carefully to our members to see what they like. You know, we're still in our beta phase, really, and just launching. So someone had requested to have a a couple setting, and so we might we might add that as well um, because we, you know we don't have any judgments about whether or not uh, someone. Uh, someone basically wants to look with a partner. Uh, and in fact, I think, you know, one of the wonderful things about the lifestyle community is the fact that they're able to talk about their kinks with their partners and in some cases bring on additional partners. And, you know, I, I think that can all be part of healthy sexuality when it's discussed openly and honestly. Right, right. So, or I should say healthy intimacy, rather. Sure. So walk us through it. Someone goes to the website they can download the app uh walk us through the steps in you know registering sure. and getting involved i mean the easiest way is really just to go to the app store and s- either whether it's the the google play store or the apple store and search for kinky k n k i app um so it's k n k i it's not not uh, the proper spelling we moved around the the i um to make it kinky and download the app onto your uh, smartphone or tablet. And then basically you create a profile and it just asks you a few questions about what you're looking for, your sex, sex uh, your gender, your sexuality. And you can, there's many options to choose from. And asks you to upload at least one photo, but preferably many more. And then you can begin to see who nearby you is on the app or has created a profile on the app. You can follow people. If you find someone that you think is hot or interesting, you can follow them. And every time they upload a photo, you'll be notified. Um, You can upload your own photos uh, that can be either of you or they can be of things that you like. Um, You know, we have a lot of restrictions in terms of the content. Like all the content has to be PG. There can't be any nudity that's publicly displayed. Uh, but what you privately keep in your own folder is up to you. It's your own. It's your own business. So you can upload photos that are either public or private, and we we have people rating every single one of them. So um, you know, just because we have to comply with Apple and Google uh, guidelines that don't allow any nudity or anything that's that's too sexual. So it's a it's a very fine line. And and as I said, we we have people reviewing twenty four seven. You know, thousands and thousands of photos every day. 
But basically, you know, once you're in there, then the goal is to come back on a regular basis because new people are joining every day and there's maybe new people to your area and we're still just growing. But it's, it's really about, you know, messaging and having conversations and connecting with people who you're interested in for whatever reason. And if you have questions, it's finding someone maybe more experienced or if you have a kink, it's searching for that kink in the, we have a feed, photo feed, and in the photo feed you can search by hashtag and you can find people with, with similar hashtags and you can find people who are either, you know, located around the world or located near you. Uh, we just have, it, there's a lot of features and, uh, you know, everything is free. We do have a, a donation kind of upgrade system and we have a couple extra features there, but most, all the features that you need to do to message unlim- unlimited messages and communicate with people are all free. Well, that's pretty generous. I mean, how do you pay for that? How does the, the app get funded then? Oh, to be honest, we've actually been getting a lot of donations. So a lot of people have voluntarily been been donating us because I think they feel really validated. So we have been getting signups from people um, and that helps to fund it. But no, this is all being funded by, by us because we believe longer, you know, right now we're, we're just trying to build the community and we're just, we're mostly focused on, you know, how can we create the best experience for people so that they come in there, they really find what they're looking for, or they find something that's meaningful and engaging to them and that they can basically explore Explore their kinks safely and honestly, and we want Kinky to become their de facto default app. And you know, if we can if we can do that, then you know we won't. You know, I feel confident that you know some percentage of people will support us, and we'll we'll be good. Great, great. So you mentioned safety, and this is always a great time to review, really safety with any kind of online meeting app. Uh, but talk about what you recommend to folks who may be getting into the online dating world specifically with an app like this for the first time? Sure. I mean, so there, there's a couple things. So safety, if we're talking about physical safety in in meeting someone, uh, obviously if you're uncomfortable meeting with someone at their home, you know, meeting out in public first and just like any date, any whether you're on Christian, Christian Mingles or kink.com, you know, you, you know, should always be, you know, careful uh, of, of, of what you know, of who you're meeting and where you're going and maybe tell a friend or someone that you know where you're going ahead of time, you know, always, always be careful. Within the kink community, one of the basic tenets of, is, is the concept of a safe word. It's the concept of boundaries and understanding what those boundaries are and having a discussion about boundaries and safe words and what people want ahead of time before the, the, you know, the act of intimacy. And that is something that's amazing. Can you imagine if everyone had those kind of, you know, in-depth discussions prior to having sex? You wouldn't have any, any confusion. So in fact, in the kink world, people who are in it, because of the complexity involved, it really requires a conversation. So I think the best way for you to keep yourself safe is usually to communicate what you need, what your limits are, and what you're looking for, honestly and openly to your partner. Um, so you know, I think that first and foremost, those are those are the two things that I would say in order that, that you should do in order to keep yourself safe. Yeah, and I think a, a specific app like this really allows that to happen more easily than it would on. I'll use your example, <laughs> ChristianMingle.com. dot <laughs> com. Love the comparison. Um, and even meeting someone in a bar setting, you know, you it, it, if you're looking for a particular type of relationship, there's so much more that gets in the way of getting down to the meat and potatoes of trying to find what you want in a bar setting versus an app like this where everybody's there for kind of the same thing. And and you can, as you say, find those matching hashtags and then have those specific conversations about your particular interests. Absolutely. I mean, the other piece that I want to say about safety is that, I mean, obviously this isn't a rule, but a lot of the times when people, um, find themselves in situations where they're uncomfortable. There's drugs or alcohol involved, right? People are too drunk, they're high, or there's and, and I have nothing against either drugs or alcohol. But in general, if you know, making sure that you and if you're really concerned about that, making sure that you and your partner are both completely sober is a really good place to start because then you know people are able to they have the facility to be able to respect each other and to understand when no means no and to not you know, go off their rails, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, I think, the, you know, one of the wonderful things about app culture is you don't have to get drunk in order to meet someone. You can, in fact, just go on and and do that. And uh, so, you know, I just want to encourage people to, you know, make good, make good choices. Well, 
Right. I mean, if those conversations can take place in a sober state ahead of time and everybody feels that comfortable where they don't have to get intoxicated in order to enjoy the other person, um, then maybe you'll enjoy it a whole lot more safely and a lot more sober in a lot more sober state, you know, when you, when you do meet. Right. And I think it's especially important when you're talking about boundaries and you're a beginner. You know, you don't want to be drunk and saying yes to something that later you're going to regret. And so I think if you're pushing your boundaries uh, and, and really approaching, approaching your kinky life as something that's a, an experiment like anything else. Like, hey, will I like this? Will I not like it? Let me see. If I don't like it, okay, I won't do it again. Right. If I'm liking it a lot, let me push myself. You know, we don't have to fear these things so much. I think, you know, everyone who's listening, myself included, can probably think to things that they might want to try but they're afraid to or that they've held back. And wouldn't it be amazing if, if you, you found that that was something that you enjoyed, that gave you pleasure? I, I mean, we... Pleasure is, is not the end-all, be-all, but I think it is and can be very freeing for people. I think that learning how to have sex in a relaxed way, learning how to explore our boundaries, sometimes giving up control, I think all these things can be really eye-opening experiences. And it makes me sad sometimes that people don't understand the kink community, that people somehow think it's perverted or perverse or, you know, that stuff is just, you know, BS. It's just, you know, people in the kink community are just people who've been, who are smart enough and aware enough to recognize that, hey, you know what? They can own their sec- the things that turn them on sexually, that they don't have to have fear and shame around them. Right. Well, I think the other, the other big stereotype out there that's absolutely false is that this is all a gay thing, um, which is clearly not the case, as evidenced by you know the, the interest I'm sure you've seen in the straight community. But here locally, if you go to Folsom Street Fair, there's probably as many straight folks there as there are gay folks now. Um, it's an oh, interest. Yeah. It's an interest that crosses all all uh, areas of sexuality on the spectrum. A- absolutely. I mean, it's as I said. I think the new generation, younger people today, are just much more free about talking about what they're looking for and what they need. And I, I can tell you on kink on the kinky app, I mean, I, you know, over eighty or ninety percent of the people that are joining are all straight, and we build it not as straight or gay, just as for everyone, but. There are a lot of kinky straight people, and good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what well, I say, you know. Exactly. Why should we all have? Why should we just have all the fun, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think one of the fears that people have um, is that uh, kids are going to get on. Uh, what safeguards do you have in place around age? Okay. Well, first of all, just to be really clear, I'll have to kind of uh, be a little bit of the badass daddy for a second. So, every person who decides to engage in a a sexual encounter with someone else is responsible for making sure that the person they hook up with is not underage based on the state that you're in. You know, it's usually 17 or 18 uh, based on wherever you might live. So, you know, if you think that someone looks too young, <laughs> make sure you get their ID or go home and find someone closer to your age. Um, but within the app world, you know, we, we review every single profile photo that is uploaded. Does that mean that the person who uploads a photo uploads the photo of themselves? Not necessarily. We can't verify that. Um, it's also anonymous. Our, our app is anonymous, and all the billing even goes through Apple. So we we make people say that they're that, that they're over uh, over eighteen, I believe, uh, but it might be seventeen or eighteen. I'm not sure what the Apple setting is, but either way, you know, in order to uh, you know, we, 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 we basically review the photos and if someone looks like they're too young, then we will, we will uh, not allow them on the site or our members will flag someone if they come, become aware that someone else is underage because they look underage, they'll flag their profile and then we'll review it again ourselves as okay, best as so, we can. So there is a way for a user then to report someone who they discover is underage. Absolutely. And we want them to report them to us so that we can remove them off, off the app because the app is for adults. All the apps, Daddy Hunt, Kinky App, Mr. X, you know, they're all, they're all adult based dating sites. And we, we don't want our members to, to hook up with people and then later say, Oh wait, that person was underage. Right. You know, that's, you know, they can, they ha- they'll have to wait a little bit longer. I noticed when I went to look at the, the site online, not on the app necessarily, but online it may be on the app as well, but I saw it online is there's a place for people to post stories and be able to read stories. So if you're looking to explore the kink world a little bit. Talk about what someone might find in those stories. Well, we're just starting to kind of assemble the stories and we're just starting to, uh, you know, basically 
provide information and support for people who are interested in exploring that. And you can go to kinkyapp.com. That's K-N-K-I-A-P-P.com slash blog. has a bunch of information that we're posting. And our hope is that our own members will be contributing uh, different pieces of content about different aspects of kink. Uh, and we're hoping that they put that both into their profiles on the site as well as giving us great content that we can post up on the, on the website. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, we want people to learn and we want people to be educated about the kinky world and the kinky lifestyle. And we know a lot of people may be interested in a particular kink or have, have an interest or a, a curiosity about it, but may not actually know how it really works and how to find someone to explore that with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we realize that we have to provide, um, you know, some support and, Again, our hope is that members of the community who are really knowledgeable and experienced will come on, will make this their own uh, community, and will be there to support other people who are interested in learning more. So what are some of your visions for the future of the app? Some exciting things that, that you're looking to adding to it? Um, sure. Well, we're, we're, yeah, no, we're, 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 we're basically actually we're collecting a lot of feedback from our users right now and prioritizing that features that they want things that they want to see um, you know whether it's the ability to maybe separate out entire groups of people so that they don't get contacted by people they aren't interested in or um, find ways to share events and munches that they're that are coming up so we're we you know we we're right now we're just focused on getting the members to be aware of the features that we currently have and building on what's what's there. Um, we really hope that people will start using the feed photos, you know, which is basically a private, you know, Instagram or Facebook within the app because, you know, so many of so many of the larger mainstream uh, you know, social networks really you know, they really discourage any sexualized content. They don't really see the King community as a community or that this is really viable. They really see it as sex. And so there's a lot of censorship. There's a lot of no's, a lot of photos that will get taken down. And um, so, you know, we really want people to use Kinky app as if it's their, you know, kinky Instagram or their kinky Facebook that they feel comfortable sharing photos on. And so our goal is to really try to amplify and expand on those features, get people to using the hashtags, um, and really encouraging them to make, make this their, their app. Great. Tell us again where our listeners can go to learn more about. Sure. Sure. So go to the Google play store or the uh, Apple app store and search for kinky K N K I app and just download it there. It's free to download and install on your smartphone or tablet. And, uh, and then create a free profile and uh, come play. Fantastic. And if you missed that website, we'll have it on our own website at outbeatnews.com. Just click on show notes at the top of the page. We've been talking with Carl Sandler, who is the creator and founder of a new app called Kinky. Carl, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Greg, for having me. I appreciate it. And that wraps up our hour. My thanks to our guests tonight, Darren Mazaika and Carl Sandler. Tune in next Sunday night to Outbeat Radio's Living Proof with Sheridan Gold and Dr. Diana Grayer. That's at 8 p.m. and only here on KRCB Radio 91. In the meantime, have a great week, and thanks for spending your Sunday night with us. Outbeat News in Depth is hosted and produced by Greg Moralia exclusively for KRCB Radio. You can listen to our shows on demand on iTunes and on our website at OutbeatNews.com. And be sure to follow us all week long on our Facebook page and Twitter feed for the latest LGBT news from here in the North Bay and beyond. Listening to KRCB FM, Windsor, Santa Rosa, Radio 91. Online all the time at krcb.org. It's 9 p.m. Stay with us. Open Space District is next.